Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining this evening and for inviting me to speak about the Solent Seagrass Restoration Project. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing over the past two years or so, as well as our aspirations for the future. Uh, but firstly, just to give a bit of an introduction to the Wildlife Trust and who we are. Um, we're a federation of 46 local trusts that span the length and breadth of the UK. And we all sit under the umbrella of the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts, um, which represent us at a national level. And we form the membership um, underneath the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts, but we're all independent charities. And collectively, we're working to protect and restore wildlife and wild places um, and to help bring people closer to nature. At Hampshire Wildlife, Wildlife Trust, we've been running for over 60 years and we manage over 50 nature reserves across the two counties from meadows to heathlands, woodlands, coastal habitats. We run four education centres. Um, we have over 27,000 members, more than 100 staff and uh, over 1,500 volunteers without whom we couldn't do a lot of the work that we do. <laughs> Uh, we in, work to inspire people to bring about positive change for our uh, local environment and for our wildlife. Um, and we're really lucky at Hampshire and I have Wildlife Trust because we have a policy and advocacy team. And that means that we're able to um, engage with our local MPs and local councillors um, and help to influence policy um, at both a local and national level. So onto seagrass, it's the only marine flowering plant. So it's the only um, flowering plant that's able to live in seawater and pollinate while submerged. And it first evolved from terrestrial plants around 100 million years ago. It now spans across 159 countries from the tropics to the Arctic, making it one of the most widespread coastal habitats on earth. Uh, it can easily be confused with seaweeds when out in the field, but there are some key differences. Seaweeds have a hold fast, which allows um, the algae to anchor itself onto a hard substrate like rock or reef, whereas seagrasses have a complex root system, which helps to anchor the plant into the sediment. Seaweeds also get a lot of their nutrients and minerals directly from the water column uh, via diffusion whereas seagrasses has uh, internal transport system or veins, which helps to transport the nutrients and minerals throughout the plant from the roots. Um, and the um, veins have tiny air pockets called lacunae, which help to keep the plant, for the plant afloat in water. Um, and seagrasses also produce flowers um, and seeds, and they're closely related to ginger and lilies. We find seagrass in shallow sheltered areas such as harbours, estuaries, lagoons and bays and this is where wave action is limited but light availability is high um, and they're one of the most productive ecosystems in the world with over 70 species worldwide and we've got three of those here in the Solent. Uh, so we have Zostra mariner which is also known as common eelgrass, Zostra noltii also known as dwarf eelgrass and then we have a tasselweed uh, or rupia species and there's been some sightings of this in Chichester Harbour, but the sightings have been quite sparse. So the two species that we're focusing on as part of our restoration work are Zostra marina and Zostra noltii. Uh, we find Zostra noltii in the intertidal zone, so the area that's uncovered daily by seawater as the tide goes in and out. Uh, and it likes to grow on um, fine sandy mud. Um, it grows to a length of around 22 centimetres and a diameter of around 0.0. Um, one to 0.2 millimetres, um, as opposed to Sostra marina, which is a much larger plant, can grow up to a metre in length, but more commonly around 30 to 50 centimetres, with a di diameter of around 4 to 10 millimetres. And this likes to grow on um, sand or fine gravel. Um, and in the UK, it's considered uh, a fully marine species, so it likes to be const constantly submerged uh, in seawater. Whereas Zostra noltii, you rarely find that below the low watermark um, and it's tolerant of desiccation and drying out. So we find it higher up on the shoreline. So this is the species that we find more commonly in our harbours, um, whereas Zostra marina we find slightly further out um, and we see a lot of this on the north coast of the Isle of Wight. Uh, and these habitats are incredibly important for our marine life in the Solent. They uh, add structural complexity to the seabed. 
and this provides a really important foraging and refuge habitat for loads of um, marine life from juvenile and adult crab species, stalk jellyfish, pipefish, uh, sea anemones, nudibranch, um, seahorses. We also have the cuttlefish which migrate to shallower waters to our seagrass meadows in the spring and summer months to lay their eggs known as sea grapes which you can see in the left hand um, photo here. Uh, and seagrass habitats also provide a really important nursery and spawning ground for our commercial fish species like plaice, pollock and bass. Uh, and bass actually spend seven years in the Solent and its estuaries before joining the migratory adult population. So a really important habitat for, for lots of our marine life, um, but they also provide us with a lot of benefits. Um, their long leaves slow the water flow rates and currents underneath the canopy, um, and that helps to slow down wave energy um, uh, and reduces the, uh, or slows down the wave energy that reaches our shores and helps to act as a natural coastal defense. Uh, and their rhizomes also help with this. So the rhizomes, which are the horizontal stems beneath the sediment, which is how they, re so seagrasses reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, and with their rhizomes, that's how they produce clones and produce asexually by sending up vegetative shoots from the rhizomes. Um, but it's also those that, uh, the rhizomes that help to stabilize the sediment. Um, and again, that helps to reduce coastal erosion acting as a natural sea defense. They also help to improve our water quality by absorbing excess nutrients out of the water column. Um, and perhaps most excitingly, and why seagrass has gained so much attention over the last um, few years, is their potential to be a really fantastic carbon store uh, and carbon sink. Um, and they do this in two ways. So seagrasses are incredibly productive plants. They take CO2 um, out of the water very quickly and fix it in photosynthesis in order to grow their leaves and roots. But that habitat function, which slows down the water flow rates, also means that particles within the water column, including organic carbon, slow down and settle down between the seagrass leaves down onto that seabed. And those salty anoxic conditions means that the carbon is unlikely to be broken down. So if that area of seagrass habitat is undisturbed, then that carbon can be stored for millennia. There's a figure that's been shared um, quite widely that um, says that seagrasses can sequester and store carbon up to 40 times better than tropical rainforests. Um, and I think David Attenborough might have said it on the Green Planet episode. Uh, and it's true for one species of seagrass in the tropics. We're still um, understanding how effective our zostra species are at sequestering and storing carbon. And we're working with the University of Portsmouth on this to, to find, out, um, find out more by taking sediment samples and cores um, to look at the organic carbon content. But the main message is that even if it's one times better than tropical rainforest, then that's still obviously fantastic. Hopefully this video is gonna play. Um, but if it doesn't, then I can send it around afterwards. We um, borrowed an ROV from the Natural History Museum um, and it shows a Zostra mariner bed off of Benbridge Lifeboat Station on the Isle of Wight. Um, and is just uh, a really lovely example of the type of marine habitats that we have beneath the surface of the Solent. I think quite often people can look out and it can seem quite a brown and murky place. Um, and we've got these incredible habitats beneath the surface and this incredible marine life. So I'll um, maybe, Mike, if I share that video with you afterwards, and if anyone would like to see that, then we yep. can share it around. Sadly, though, our seagrass meadows are... Um, under significant pressure. Globally, it's estimated that we lose the equivalent size of two football pitches every hour of seagrass. Um, and in the UK, it's estimated that we've lost up to 90% of our seagrass meadows in the past century. In the 1920s and 1930s, a wasting disease called Labyrinthula zostra ripped through the North Atlantic um, and decimated a huge proportion of our seagrass meadows. Um, and this wasting disease is basically a slime mold which invades the leaves of the plant and creates brown lesions which inhibits the plant's ability to photosynthesize so ultimately kills um, the seagrass and there's barely been much recovery since those days. Now we have um, 
a lot of pressure from um, modern day activities to physical disturbance from coastal development and land reclamation, which can cause smothering of seagrass meadows or increase the turbidity in the water, which restricts the amount of sunlight that's able to reach the plant. There's also um, damage caused by fishing gear. So in particular, bottom toed fishing gear where um, it's either pushed or pulled along the seabed and that rips up the root and rhizome map, um, um, prevents the seagrass from establishing again in that area. There's also damage from recreational activity from recreational boat owners um, through anchors and traditional mooring systems. And I'll go on to talk a bit more about that um, over the next few slides. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, we have a real problem with water quality in the Solent as well. Um, the Solent Maritime SAC is in unfavourable condition. We have a huge amount of excess nutrients from agriculture, um, so livestock effluent from coastal background sources um, and sewage. And this excess nutrients shifts the primary production away from seagrass to fast growing microalgae. And that's when we get these algal blooms. Um, that's one of our, our seagrass meadows. There's also concerns with climate change and sea level rise and how that's going to impact the habitat. Um, so with sea level rise and increased water depth, that's going to restrict the amount of light that's able to reach the plant. Um, and there's also concerns of uh, how temperature might affect seagrass and its um, germination rates and growth as well. Uh, and the um, disease Labyrinthula zostris, that wasting disease, there's evidence that the uh, of it still in the population in the Solent, although it looks like the virulence may be reduced. So before we um, started or launched the Solent Seagrass Restoration Project, we had the Solent Seagrass Project. And this started in 2008 to, uh, or 2009 and ran to 2015. And we were funded by Natural England, the Solent Forum and the Esme Fairbarn Foundation and tasked with surveying the existing seagrass meadows across the Hampshire and Isle of Wight coastline. Um, and we were tasked with producing a seagrass inventory um, across the two coastlines. And this was to raise public awareness about seagrass, but it also meant that we were able to feed this data into some of the conservation measures that we see in the Solent today. Uh, and this is the map that resulted from that work. So you can see we've got seagrass meadows in Langston Harbour, uh, around Farlington and also on the Hailing Island side, Porchester, Chilling Beach near Titchfield Haven, Calshot, there's a really lovely Zostra Mariner bed uh, at Calshot and there's also seagrass at the mouth of the Bewley River. And then on the Isle of Wight, we see it at Benbridge Harbour, Seaview, Ride, there's a really lovely uh, Zostra Noltii bed. I don't know if, if um, you know Ride Pier, but um, next to Ripe here, that's where the Zostra Noltii bed is, isn't it? and it transitions into Zostra Mariner the further you go out. Um, a really nice bed at Osborne Bay, and then we see it at Freshwater and Yarmouth as well. So we have a good understanding, or a relatively good understanding, of where our existing seagrass meadows are. And when you see a map like that, and when you see a photo like this, you or people might be mistaken for thinking that we do have seagrass in the Solent, and when you see an image like this of a really healthy, dense seagrass bed which stretches along the coastline, this is taken at uh, Osborne Bay on the Isle of Wight. Again, you could be mistaken for thinking that, um, that we'd still have a lot of seagrass. And it's only because of historical records that we know or, or have a relative understanding of how much we've lost. So there's um, this man called Butcher who wrote in 1934 that before the outbreak of the wasting disease in Southampton Water, Hillgrass was formerly very large and abundant from Southampton up the River Hamble to Bursledon. Uh, and as a trust, we did a survey, a seagrass survey of the River Hamble back in 2011, and we couldn't find a blade of seagrass. So that gives an indication of how much we've lost. Um, and we're hoping to do another survey this year as well. As well, to, um, to give another indication of how much seagrass there used to be, um, these are some images from um, Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, so we, we don't really have a good understanding or, or have a baseline of how much there was, but, but as I say, this gives a, an indication. So you have people wading, um, harvesting seagrass, uh, and one man could harvest up to 135 kilograms of seagrass a day. 
um, which kind of gives an idea of the sustainability of that resource that was able to to happen for such a long time and it was used uh, or had various uses so they used to dry it out and um, use it for stuffing furniture like chairs uh, in off, uh, an island off of Denmark they actually used it to thatch roofs um, so there used to be a group of 40 to 50 women that used to go and harvest seagrass or collect it in the autumn when it had been washed up by the storms they would lay it out on the fields to dry for a period of six months and then once it had dried then that meant that it was um it didn't have any microalgae on it and it was resistant to rot and then they used to similar to wool used to um wind it up into large ropes uh, and then do the base of the thatch roof and then pile lots of peat and more seagrass on top and they did this for hundreds of years so um, some of the roofs are 300 400 years old which again gives an idea of of the extent of seagrass that there was to be able to do that um, and in the netherlands this photo on the left hand side at the bottom seagrass was used for coastal defenses it used to be mixed with clay and soil um, uh, to form this dike here so this is a, a hundred year old dike in the netherlands um, so had a huge amount of uses um, but sadly as i said earlier we've lost now a huge amount um, of, of our seagrass meadows. so we don't really have an idea of what um, product biologically diverse productive healthy seagrass meadows look like but there are seeds of hope and what uh, we're working towards is protecting the seagrass that we have and also looking to restore what we've lost. So the data that we collected as part of the Solent Seagrass project from 2008 to 2015 helped to contribute to Southern IFCA's decision to introduce a bylaw. So Southern IFCA um, are responsible for the sustainable management of inshore fisheries up to six nautical miles out from the coastline. Um, and our data fed into their decision to introduce a bylaw which now prevents bottom toed fishing gear being used in areas of the Solent where there's seagrass meadows, which is a fantastic win. Um, there's some areas that are, are exempt at the moment, unfortunately. So Seaview is an area that is exempt from this bylaw, but it's going through its next iteration at the moment. It's just gone through its consultation phase. And so we're hoping when it's all finalized that Seaview will be included in that as well. And that's where we're doing some of our restoration work. So it's a, uh, an area we're particularly concerned about uh, and interested in. So we're working to, um, to introduce conservation measures to help protect seagrass, but we're also looking at behavioural change as well. And we're working with the Life Recreation Remedies Project, um, which is an EU funded project, partnership project led by Natural England. Um, and it focuses on five key special areas of conservation across the south coast of England, including the Solent Maritime SAC. Um, and as part of the project, it's looking to raise awareness of seagrass meadows, working to restore seagrass meadows um, in certain areas as well, but also looking at um, behavioural change, particularly with recreational boat owners. Uh, the Solent's enjoyed by lots of um, recreational boat owners, whether that be sailors or um, motorboats. But unfortunately, in some areas, we're seeing significant damage from anchors and traditional mooring systems. Um, when anchors are dropped down and with the chain that can rip up the root mat and rhizome layer, reducing the resilience of, of that area of seagrass meadow. Um, and traditional mooring systems are a particular um, problem. And what a traditional mooring system is, it's basically a big concrete slab, which is put down onto the sea floor. It takes up quite um, a large amount of surface area and then coming off of that you have a chain and then you have a buoy on, on the surface of the water which then uh, boats can moor, moor up to but what happens with the movement of the wind and the tide and when boats are moored up the boats swing round and that chain um, sinks to the bottom and actually scours a circle on the seabed um, and in the seagrass meadows. And we see this again, particularly at Sea View. And there's an aerial shot here where you can see the mooring scars that have been created from the traditional mooring systems. Uh, so as part of the project, they've been working with the Green Blue, who are part of the Royal Yachting Association to create the Green Guide to Anchoring and Mooring. So that's giving boat owners best practice 
um, on how to anchor. And this is a free online resource open to, to anybody. They're also looking at mapping um, the seagrass meadows and putting this onto nautical charts so boat owners know where seagrass meadows are so they are more uh, well informed uh, of where they should be anchoring and, and where they want to launch and retrieve their vessels. Uh, they're also putting posters up in marinas and boat clubs and, and just engaging and working with the recreational boating community so they have an understanding of the importance of these habitats um, and to try and limit the, the damage the anchors and moorings do to them. They're also um, looking to install advanced mooring systems and these have been used um, in other parts of the world for 30 years, um, but we haven't used them uh, in the UK so far. We're starting to have trials, I should say. So there's been some trials in Falmouth and we're gonna be having some trials in the Solent as well um, and around Osborne Bay and Cowes, I believe. And an advanced mooring system is basically, instead of having that big concrete slab you have a helical screw which drills down into the seabed so you've got a much smaller surface area then coming off of that there's two systems you have either have an elastic road which then connects to a buoy so that elastic road flexes with the movement of the wind and the tide or you have um, again with the helical screw and you have the chain but you have buoys connected at different parts of the chain so that you don't have that sinking and scouring effect so in terms of um, protecting what we have with legislation, we, we have progress with the bottom toed fishing bylaw that's been introduced um, and we're in progress with behavioural change. So we're now looking to restore some of the areas of seagrass that we've lost. And this is where the Solent Seagrass Restoration Project comes in, in partnership with Boscalis Westminster, who are a marine engineering company uh, and we also work with the University of Portsmouth, who are our academic partners on the project. Uh, and through the partnership with Boscalis Westminster, they're supporting or have supported an initial two year research and development phase, including a feasibility study for working with Zostra Marina and Zostra Nultii. They've provided staff funding for my colleague, Tim, who's the lead on the Solent Seagrass Restoration Project for two days a week, and uh, also my staff funding um, they're supporting us to upskill our team in restoration techniques, uh, supporting EMRA students to monitor and quantify the seagrass's role in blue carbon sequestration and support for biodiversity. And we're now coming out of that two year research and development phase and they've committed to another two years of funding, which is really exciting. Um, and so we're now looking at ways that we can upscale beyond that research and development phase. Uh, and what we found has been really beneficial working with the marine engineering company is that it's opened us up to this whole other area of expertise. Um, marine engineering equipment, they've linked us to the universities in the Netherlands with some master's engineering students who have been looking again at ways that we can upscale our restoration work and I'll go on to talk about that um, later on. So we've continued with our seagrass survey and monitoring training um, we've been taking volunteers out across the Hampshire and Isle of Wight coastline and training them up in how to survey our existing seagrass meadows. And we've been following an international protocol called the Seagrass Watch Methodology. And we lay out a 50 metre tape measure and place quadrats at every five metres. And within each quadrat, we're looking for the um, percentage cover of the different seagrass species, any epiphyte growth, so any organisms growing on the seagrass leaves, um, measuring leaf length, looking for any marine life within that quadrat. Um, and we've also added um, some extra columns to the record sheet because we want to monitor the flowering shoots and seed development as well. So by doing this survey and monitoring work, we're not only understanding and building on our knowledge of the health and extent of our existing seagrass meadows, but it also gives us an idea of where we want to start doing things like seed collection and our restoration work. In July, we um, have been going out on the Isle of Wight at Seaview with volunteers snorkeling and wading to collect the seagrass seed. And we basically swim along or wade and then we're collecting these flowering shoots. And we just, it, they come um, off very easily and just with the tips of our fingers, pulling that off and then putting that in a mesh bag. Um, we collect the the um, space containing the developing seagrass seed and then we take this to the Institute of Marine Sciences at the University of Portsmouth 
store it in aquaria tanks for a couple of months and this is while it goes through a process of rotting out which is where the plant material decays the seeds mature and drop out of the spades and that means that we can collect them and clean them ready for planting so this image here is of Zostra marina, which is a lot easier to collect than Zostra noltii. Uh, this is a Zostra noltii bed. You can see some algae, the lighter green is the algae, but the darker green is Zostra noltii. And this is at Farlington. And we walk out onto the mud flats wearing these things called mud patterns, which are basically planks of marine plywood that we strap onto our Wellington boot. Um, and it allows us to walk out onto the mud without sinking. We then lay down on foam body boards, sifting through the seagrass leaves, trying to find these tiny Zostra noltii seeds. Um, and it's a lot longer process. So when we did the seed collection in um, July for the Zostra mariner, we probably had three sessions of seed collection and collected 13,500 seed. With the Zostra noltii, we were out um, probably 15 20 sessions and collected under 5,000 seed um, so it's a lot more labor intensive and a lot more time consuming um, and we also found that this year the seed development in the harbors was significantly delayed and we and that was seen on the, nor the northern coast of France as well and we think that was because of the extreme temperatures that we had in the summer and that might have delayed seed development so Whereas in 2021, we'd have finished collecting at the end of September, we were still seeing flowering shoots through October to November. So it was significantly delayed and that um, impacted our uh, seed collection haul as well. Again, that's Austronolchai is taken to the aquaria tanks and left to rot out over a period of a couple of months. And then when, when that's happened, we then uh, gather in the labs at the Institute of Marine Sciences to pack the seeds into Hessian seed pods. We use hessian because it's a biodegradable material uh, and it also protects the seeds from predation from green shore crabs. Green shore crabs absolutely love seagrass seeds and we have thousands of them in Langston Harbour. Um, and we've got volunteers set up at different stations, some cutting the hessian, some putting some sediment into the um, hessian seed pod and then we put seeds on top um, uh, and then tie that up ready to be planted out in the Solent. We had our first planting in December 2021 at Farlington. We um, deployed 1,025 seed pods containing 21,000 Zostra noltii seeds, which had been collected locally. And we had two plots. We had a 12 by 12 meter plot and a 15 by 50 meter plot, trialing two different seed densities, so 15 and 30 per pod. We were really encouraged to see that they survived the storms. Uh, and what happens is as you you basically plant the hessian seed pod just so it's flush with the surface and it has a tail which helps to anchor that seed pod in place into the mud so we were really encouraged to see that they survived the storms we thought that that might have washed away a lot of the sediment and the seed pods but they were still there we visited a number of times but unfortunately um due to the temperatures and just the amount of nutrients that we have in langston harbour that our plots were covered in a thick blanket of over fertilized algae for the majority of the year um, but it was a good lesson it's a reminder of the challenges that we face doing seagrass restoration and going forward with our restoration work in the harbors we're going to be a lot more tentative so we're going to be going back and actually removing the algae from the plots um, and potentially working with a project called Rantrans who are also working on algal removal uh, in Langston Harbour and Paul Harbour to seeing if we can do some work with them. Then in March last year, we went out um, and did a deployment with Zostra mariner seeds. So the Ocean Conservation Trust very kindly donated us 20,000 Zostra mariner seeds. Uh, and we did two small scale deployments. So we had a plot at, in Langston Harbour on the Hailing Island side planting a strip across a gully because we've noticed that Zostra mariner seems to like to grow in gullies um, on the mudflats again because it's, they're submerged in seawater and then we also did a plot at sea view on the Isle of Wight again trialing different seed densities this time 20 and 30 per pod we had BBC country file come and film our planting at Langston and if anyone's interested I can send you the link to that there's also um, some footage of the Ocean Conservation Trust who did some seagrass restoration work in the Bewley and they did that by barge boat, whereas we work in the intertidal area, so by foot. 
Um, and we've gone back to the sea view deployment and we've seen seedling growth coming from the bags, which is really encouraging. It's not a beautiful green patch of seagrass, but we are seeing seedlings coming through. So it's the proof of concept that it does work. Um, and we were also seeing some wild recruitment there as well. We did our final deployment last year in October, again with Zostromarina seed, this time the ones that we collected through snorkeling and wading. We've changed the design of the seed pods slightly. We were seeing that um, with our previous seed pods, we had a, quite a lot of sediment in. And when we were excavating them and digging them up, we found that they were very black and anoxic. So by having a smaller bag, less sediment, we're hoping that will increase the diffusion of oxygen and the water flow rate into the bag. Um, and so hopefully that won't be so much of an issue. We trialed uh, 15 seeds per bag, 30 and 45, and we've kept some seed pods back in the aquarium tanks at the University of Portsmouth and are seeing seedlings coming through. So we're going to go back to check on the site over the next couple of, uh, next few weeks. Uh, we're trying different planting methods. So as I said earlier, we've been working with some master's engineering students in the, uh, at the University of Delft in the Netherlands, and they've created um, a seed sorting prototype they've created this vortex which helps us to um, sort through the seeds which massively helps to shorten down the process and they've also um, designed a planting machine as well so they wanted us to try planting vertically because they said that that would be easier um, than planting horizontally at sea view it's a very different sediment to the in the harbors it's um, it's sandy and in the intertidal zone so rather than just putting the seed pod in with our hand in the, as we would in the mud and it goes in very easily we have to actually dig up with the trowel to hand plant them so by having a planting machine that will hopefully help to speed up the process and allow us to upscale um, and uh, well, yeah we'll be back soon to monitor for seedling growth uh, but the work that we've been doing wouldn't have been possible without the help and support we have from our volunteers we launched the Solent Seagrass Champion volunteer role in January 2022 uh, and we promoted this on social media through our e-newsletters website and word of mouth um, and we found that it's been a really fantastic way for people to engage with the marine environment because all our work is in happens in the intertidal zone um, which means that we can get out by foot we don't need to worry about diving or having a boat um, it means it's really accessible there's no particular background or experience necessary for people. They're involved in all aspects of the restoration work from the monitoring and surveying through to the collection of seed, packing and planting. Uh, it's a really good way for people to gain skills and knowledge of the work required to secure the future of this amazing habitat. Um, and what we found is that their enthusiasm and dedication helps to inspire other people to learn about seagrass and the importance of protecting our local marine habitats and species. Um, and we've had 180 volunteers sign up so far um, within a year from Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and afar as well. We have various age range, so um, we found that it's attracted a real varied demographic of people, which has been lovely. Uh, we've had over 400 volunteer hours contributed so far, um, and we've trained 30 of them up in seagrass monitoring and surveying techniques with the idea that once the, pe the people have received um, seagrass monitoring and surveying training that they can go out as a group of volunteers individually without Hampshire Isle of Wight staff will be on call but it means that we can cover a much wider area of the Solent on the limited number of low spring tides that we have and our plans for this year and going forwards we're going to follow up and monitor our current seagrass restoration deployments and continue to work with Boscalis Westminster on upscaling uh, we'll continue with our seed collecting on the Isle of Wight um, and in the harbours and, and working on further restoration trials. So looking at um, using another method where instead of using Hessian seed pods, we're actually going to try injecting seeds directly into the mud with uh, glue gum. Um, so directing the seed directly in down to around a depth of around three centimetres. And this has been trialled in the Dutch Wadden Sea, and they've seen really high levels of success, um, which we're really encouraged by. So we're going to be trialling that um, at the beginning of March with the Zostronolti I see to be collected. We've also recently been successful in receiving funding for the ELP Solent Seascape project. Um, and this is a $5 million 
project funded by the Endangered Landscapes Programme, and we're working with nine other partners in the Solent, uh, including the Blue Marine Foundation, RSPB, um, Chichester Harbour Conservancy. And we're going to be working on seascape scale restoration. So that's uh, seagrass, salt marsh, oysters, uh, and seabird nesting habitat as well. Um, and that's over the next five years. We're going to be working to develop and expand the Solent Seagrass Champion Programme and looking at areas where we could potentially bring back seagrass to sites where it's no longer present. Um, so for example, the Hamble, as I said, we're going to go and do a survey and see if we can find any seagrass um, and then look at what we need to start to, to be doing to, to get the ball, ball rolling um, to see if we can do a small restoration trial in the Hamble as well. Um, and in terms of you or anyone who's interested in, in getting involved, um, then there's opportunities to volunteer and help us with the monitoring and surveying. Um, we also have a sponsor a seagrass pod campaign as well, um, where you can sponsor the work that we're doing. Thank you.